Looking forward to a lot of great, great preaching this week, and we're looking forward to the Lord's blessings as we enjoy this great gospel meeting. I want to take just a moment to introduce Brother Grider to you. Uh, he has been here before, and he actually is preaching at the congregation that I was at before we came over here the first time. So I, we have a lot of close friends, a lot of uh, mutual connections, and really appreciate Brother Grider. He's doing a great work there in Dalton. He has preached in three states, and he is presently with the Riverbend Church there in Dalton. He is married to his wife, Celicia. They have three college-age children, and I don't want to make this uh, ruin it, but he is an Alabama fan. So uh, we'll pray for success, I guess. Uh, but we do appreciate him so much. He's going to do an excellent job for us this week. He'll do an excellent job for the Lord. Uh, before we get into our class period, though, we want to have a time of prayer, and so I want to ask you to bow with me. Our God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for all of our wonderful blessings that you give us every second of our lives. Our God, we love you, and we are so thankful to be called your children by your merciful grace. Father, we pray that you'll continue to be merciful to us, that you will forgive all of our sin, that you will continue to use us for your glory. Lord, there are so many who are suffering with various problems right now, physical, emotional. We pray that you would continue to bless them and use us to comfort them. Father, we are mindful of so many who are suffering spiritually. Father, we pray that this gospel meeting effort would be an opportunity to bring those to you so that they might come to, uh, to know you, to know the source of life, and to live life better here and more abundantly forever with you. Father, we pray that you'll bless this congregation. Help us to do everything we can to make this meeting a success as we depend upon you for everything. Lord, we are so thankful that we can come to you in prayer and ask for your blessings and to express our adoration for you. Father, we pray that you'll be with Brother Barry now as he presents his lesson to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's right. I, 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 I do pull for the Crimson Tide. I spent about four years getting my education at the University of Alabama, but, but I also try to be wise, and so as I was selecting my apparel for this gospel meeting, I paid close attention to my shirt and tie for this morning. Alabama was just... Uh, uh, defeated in their football game a week ago, and I said, Mississippi State's doing really well. Mississippi State's doing really well. They, they just might do the same thing, you know. And, and so uh, I said, well, I'll wear this, this crimson maroon-looking tie. And if Alabama wins, I'll feel good about wearing this tie. But if, on the other hand, Mississippi State wins, I have a good idea there are probably a few Mississippi State fans here, I'll just blend right in, you know, so... Anyway, that's why I selected this tie. Uh, I have always enjoyed college football, but we do get caught up in it, don't we? And uh, yesterday, not the best day for the state of, of Mississippi, whether you're an Ole Miss fan or Mississippi State fan. And it's true, uh, after last Saturday, uh, I kind of know what you may be feeling this morning. Uh, I have followed that Alabama-Tennessee game for years. Alabama's had some success for a while, and my son, I guess he inherited my love for Alabama football from me. He just about uh, just uh, is overwhelmed every Saturday by college football, and particularly Alabama football, almost too much so. But, but he said some time ago, he said, You know, Dad, I feel like Tennessee just might win this year. And I said, well, it's possible they might. Seems like they have a good team, and I think maybe we're struggling in some areas. And I said, and when it happens, get ready, because you've not seen anything like this, son, when Tennessee beats Alabama. And he paused a moment, and he said, you know, Dad, he said, I've heard that's true. He said, maybe the Lord will come before that happens. <laughs> well, the Lord didn't come before Tennessee beat Alabama, but... Anyway, I, I'm so thankful that the Lord's Day follows a Saturday, and we all come together in, in unity, and wonderful to be together as God's people on this 
nice autumn day. I am thankful my wife is with me. Uh, Celicia uh, has been busy rearing our children during those times I'm away in gospel meetings. They're all college age now, as Brother Donnie mentioned. And so uh, we delight in leaving them behind now. And uh, she's with me today, just today, and she'll be back on Wednesday. Sadly, her mother passed away this uh, back in June. And uh, so her dad is now widowed. And she's a daddy's girl. And she's going to be traveling up to Memphis this afternoon to visit with her dad a few days. And then she'll return on uh, Wednesday uh, when we get ready to close out the meeting. But I am glad to have her traveling with me. Rarely happens. This is the first time that I have come into Ripley, at least uh, to the Ripley uh, Church, for a special occasion, be a gospel meeting or a summer series. And I've been here several times before. It's the first time I've come in from the, from the east side. I usually come down from Memphis. I was in Memphis, uh, congregation in Memphis for 18 years. But I've been in River Bend, at the River Bend Church in Dalton, Georgia now for about four years. And that's just outside of Chattanooga. And so when I returned to that particular area, it was somewhat like returning home. I didn't grow up in Dalton, but I did grow up in the Chattanooga area. My parents uh, are on up in years, but still living, and I'm close to where they live. can check on them often. But yesterday, as we uh, uh, were traveling uh, from Tennessee into Alabama on Highway 72... I was reminded that that particular area is where I was reared. And I couldn't help but think, uh, driving along that four-lane Highway 72, how nice it is that there was a time when I was a boy, I can recall that was just a, a two-lane road. In fact, this present highway that runs from Tennessee into Alabama wasn't even in existence at the time when I was a child. But I can remember being out some country roads in the middle of fields and hearing my dad say something like this. He said, one of these days they're going to bring Highway 72 right through these, these fields, these pastures, and it's going to be a four-lane road, and I couldn't believe it. No way is a major highway going to be coming right through these fields. But you know, uh, that's the way it is today. That's the road I travel. He also told me something like that. He said, the Tennessee Valley Authority is going to build over there by the Tennessee River a smokestack that's going to be a thousand feet high. It will be higher than Sand Mountain, which runs parallel to the river. And I couldn't believe that, that uh, actually there'd be a smokestack that'd be higher than Sand Mountain. But you know they built that smokestack. And uh, they've already torn down that smokestack. But it did exist for a number of years. I go back to that area often to visit with my parents and other relatives, and I notice that uh, some things seem familiar, but there are a lot of things that have changed through the years. And you've probably noticed that even here in Ripley, Mississippi, and across the northern part of this state where many of you no doubt have lived all of your lives. Some things are familiar, but there have been a lot of changes too. And we recognize that change is a part of life. Sometimes it's good, sometimes not so good. But isn't it wonderful that in a world where there is so much change and at times decay, uh, where there is, is uh, so much strife and so much uncertainty, that we can turn to a particular resource that is unchanging. One thing is true, I know, the God I heard about when I was a boy being reared in North Alabama is the same God today. He hasn't changed. Of the second person of the divine Godhead, Jesus the Christ, we're told in Hebrews 13, 8, He's the same yesterday, today, yea, and forever. We need something to which we can cling that is unchanging. God says, I change not. That is, His character is always the same. And I'm so thankful for that, that the God I learned about as a child, the God I learned to love as a little boy, is the same God today. 
His character has not changed and never will change. He is just as holy as he was then. He's just as loving as he was then. Just as forgiving as he was then. I'm thankful for the character of God that changes not. And likewise, we know we've been given a book divine, the Bible. And since it's God's word, it does not change. And it will sustain us in the most difficult times. I love studying from Psalm 119 because Psalm 119 is really a tribute to the entire book. It's fitting that the longest chapter in the Bible would be a chapter that honors the Word of God itself. And in that particular passage, we read so many beautiful statements about, about the Bible. Verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law, it is my meditation all of the day. Most all of us can quote Psalm uh, 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The psalmist in the very first psalm, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, he mentions that the word of God is that which he would meditate upon all day long. And I certainly commend the good book to you. And I know that you love it and you want to pattern your life after it. You are here this morning in this gospel meeting during this Sunday school hour, Bible class hour, because I believe you have great reverence for the Word of God. Psalm 138, 2, God has exalted His Word even above His very name. And therefore it is good for us to, from time to time, study the Bible itself. I know we draw lessons from the Bible all of the time. That's foundational to our preaching and teaching. But sometimes it's good just to study the book itself. That is, uh, how do we know it came from God? Uh, why can we trust the Bible? Why is it that the Bible means so much to you and me? Well, the psalmist understood that the Bible or the Word of God is that which is sacred. We need to treat it as sacred as well. I think there is much in our world today that, that um, is sacred that is mocked by the secular world. We notice that often when we listen to how the people of the world talk. They are irreverent. They have little respect for what God has said. And when you try to stand up for biblical principles, don't we find that oftentimes we are maligned and scorned? Especially we see that as we follow... Uh, the news becomes disheartening at times. We find that some today are defending the unthinkable, aren't they? And it seems that, uh, uh, that the devil is having his day as the Word of God is set aside and as it is maligned and scorned. But during the next few moments, we just want to think about reasons we should love the Word of God. Because I know this, if we have a, a gospel meeting, then... Uh, we want to exalt the Word of God, don't we? If it's a gospel meeting, that means the Bible must be preached. And I've never preached a sermon where I did not appeal to the Word of God. That is foundational. And so I remember a brother who's now departed who uh, loved the Word of God so much, he would say this to me, when in doubt about a particular passage, leave it out. And I thought that was always good advice. If you're not sure what God is saying in a particular passage, then don't comment on it. Study it more. Make sure you know what God is saying because that's how careful we ought to treat the Bible, the Word of God. You know, when we study American history, aren't we thankful that when we look at the early days of this republic, that we can find that our forefathers had a great love for and appreciation for the Bible. I love reading the comments of some of our early founders, how they lauded the Bible as the best book in the world. And yet I'm also mindful of the fact that, that many uh, have, have made fun of the Bible and even, even tried to destroy the Bible. There have been those who ridiculed the Bible who have uh, thought that uh, the Bible was really dead and they were going to carry it to its grave during their lifetimes. But think about that just for a moment. 
The philosophers who predicted the death of the Bible and who tried to carry it to its grave really, uh, uh, really have been mocked because of the fact that uh, the Bible is still alive. We're still studying it. It's a situation where the corpse has outlived the pallbearers, really, isn't it? Because here we are in 2022 studying from the Bible, still appreciating the great message, even though there have been many down through the years, particularly in philosophical circles, who have said God is dead and the Bible is no longer relevant. But I would plead with you today that the Bible indeed is still relevant. It meets the spiritual needs of man just as much today as ever. And you know, no matter where you go in this world, no matter how different the culture may be, the Bible is still suited for every culture. And the Bible uh, will, will stand. We know that the Bible is going to stand because it has been providentially preserved. Jesus said uh, that uh, His Word would endure. Jesus has made clear that that at judgment there will be a book that will judge all of humanity and that book that will judge us, I believe, is none other than the Bible. For Jesus said in John twelve forty eight, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And likewise, we know that heaven and earth shall pass away, but Jesus said, My word shall not pass away. His word is truth. Nothing can come forth from the lips of the Savior that's not true. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And then he's prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. No way that God could ever speak a lie. Everything that God speaks, it is truth. Everything that Jesus spoke while he was on this earth, we can mark it down. It is true and it is true is right. And so we want to think about this idea of the Bible and what the psalmist said, oh, how I love thy law. I want to challenge us this morning to get back into the Bible again. Maybe you're an excellent Bible student. I pray that you are. But maybe you've not been spending a lot of time in God's Word, the Bible. I want to encourage you to get back to daily reading of the Bible. Not just reading the Bible, but truly studying it. Asking questions like this, what does God intend for me to learn from this particular passage? People may not realize it, and even some Christians may not realize it, but our love for God will grow in direct proportion, direct proportion to our love for His Word. I cannot say I love God and dismiss the Bible. The two go hand in hand. So if I truly love God, if I truly want to know Him better, then I realize I've got to spend some time in His holy book, Divine. And so as we think about reasons to love the Word of God, I, I would suggest, first of all, that we want to love God's Word because we realize that it is the product of inspiration. It seems like a good passage to begin any gospel meeting is, is 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, where Paul is... Uh, coming to the end of his, his earthly ministry. This is his last epistle that he would write, this second epistle to Timothy. And so he says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now I read in that passage that the Word of God is a profitable book. I like to engage in something that is profitable, don't you? And therefore, whenever we study the Bible, we can be assured that we're studying something that is good for us. And it is profitable for doctrine or teaching. It tells us what is right. It's profitable for reproof. It tells us what is wrong. It's profitable for correction. It tells us how to get right when we've gone wrong. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. It helps us to stay right, doesn't it? You remember likewise the psalmist stated, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 111, or 11. And so we listen to 
to what Paul states in that passage to Timothy, and we find, hey, studying the Bible is, is, is profitable to us, spiritually speaking. It is the book that will get us safely from this home to a home much better than this. But he says every word of God is inspired. It is God-breathed. So when we speak of the Bible's inspiration, we're not speaking about a book that was compiled by some literary genius. Sometimes we might hear someone express themselves, uh, express himself, and we say, you know what that person said, uh, that's inspiring. And yet when we say uh, this is what the Bible says, we don't mean we're studying something that is just inspiring as if it was written by mere mortals. But rather when we speak of the inspiration of the Bible, we're talking about that which came from, from God Himself. We're not talking about just the thoughts being inspired, but rather we're talking about the very words that are used were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. So it is a God-breathed book. Now, how did this happen? Well, I want you to go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you'll notice beginning in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 2, the words of Paul. Uh, Paul is the author of First and Second Corinthians, and he was trying to correct some problems that were existing in that particular congregation, and he begins 1 Corinthians talking about the importance of preaching and preaching the Word of God. And so he makes this statement in verse 9, As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, the context of this passage has to do with the with uh, inspiration. God has revealed Himself to us. You know, it's very, very important for a relationship to prosper that there be communication, correct? If a young man is desirous of, of, um, of having a young lady as his companion, then he's going to have to communicate that to her. In the marriage relationship, we must communicate with one another if the marriage is to be successful. We need to communicate to one another our love for each other. And so communication is key to the building of a friendship. Well, God has communicated Himself to us. And the process by which He has done this is through inspiration. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to me that when we study the Bible, we consider the fact that it was written over the course of many, many centuries, by some 40 different authors, by different backgrounds, socially, economically. And uh, yet there's such a harmony to the Bible that is so beautiful and makes it so interesting to read. Paul, as he addresses the church in Corinth, says, What man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And so I cannot know what you are thinking. You cannot know what I am thinking unless those thoughts are revealed. We cannot know the mind of God unless He reveals Himself to us. Now in Psalm 19, 1 and 2, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Isn't it wonderful to look upon the starry host and think about how great God is? Isn't it wonderful to see these changing colors? The leaves are changing their colors. Uh here in the fall of the year, and it makes for such beautiful scenery. I have stood uh, by the ocean as uh, uh, the waves were coming in, and I could not help, about, uh, help but to think about the power of God as those waves roared to shore. I've been in Colorado, and I've looked at those majestic peaks of the Rocky Mountains, and I couldn't help but think about the power and glory of God. But the reason that I know God created these things is because it's revealed to me in this holy book divine. It makes sense. Once I study the Bible and then I see this creation all around me, I cannot help but extol how great is my God. You know, we never want to lose our sense of wonder, do we? I remember that when my children were smaller, I used to walk them to school 
The school wasn't very far away, right there in the neighborhood where we lived. And I would walk them to school and then often would walk, uh, would go and, and meet them as they were getting out of school. We'd walk home together. And my children at that time were filled with so much wonder. Every leaf had to be examined. Every little bug had to be closely watched. Let's turn over a rock out here in the woods and let's see the, the bugs scurry all over the place. And I started thinking, you know, these children help me to appreciate what perhaps I've forgotten. How important it is in the little things to see God's hand. And so I don't want to lose my wonder for the things God has made. George Bailey, one of my favorite evangelists of all time, I heard him say this, If only once in a lifetime... The clouds were rolled back and we could see the starry host. That would impress us, wouldn't it? And yet, how often do we have the privilege of looking up in the sky at night and seeing God's marvelous creation and His power on display? Now, I cannot begin to fathom or understand everything about such a mighty being as God who is revealed to us in the Bible. But He reveals enough to us in this word that ought to cause us to stand in awe of Him and fall in love with Him and desire a relationship with Him. This book, the Bible, is the product of inspiration. Paul reminds us of that important truth in Galatians 1, 11, and 12 when he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, said what he taught, what he preached, he did not receive that from man. He received it from whom? He received it from God. It was God's message. And so how we ought to stand in awe when we read the Word of God, as we think about the Bible comes from God, and therefore uh, we want to be faithful to Him, we want to serve God, we want to be His children. And the way we learn how to please Him is by opening the pages of this, of this holy book, Divine, the Bible. Now, we would not know, we would not know who God really is without Him revealing Himself to us. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. Man needs help from above. That's why the wise man stated in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now when we think about that verse, we oftentimes hear it in connection with, with some wise individual. Don't we appreciate visionary leaders? Those who can say, uh, here's where we need to go, and, and I'm going to help lead you. And we like for somebody to have the wisdom to be able to, to look upon the vast horizon and say, here are the things we need to do, here's what we need to accomplish, and here's what we must do in order to accomplish this. But, you know, that is a type of, of, of vision, and sometimes we call that a visionary leader. But Proverbs 29, 18 makes it clear, where there's no revelation from above, people perish. Where there is no vision from on high, people perish. We need the help of God. But God did not leave us defenseless and helpless. He gave us His Word. I like this little acrostic, the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic information before leaving earth, right? That's good. We know we're not going to be here forever. We're convinced there, there is a home of the soul and we want to be there. But we need the information that is profitable to us to get us there. God has supplied. That leads us to another point as we think about our love for the Bible. I know I love God's Word because this book divine is able to penetrate the heart of the sinner. Now all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God wants to save, doesn't He? Jesus was sent to die on that cross for every man, John 3, 16, the whole world. God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of His truth. And so while He wants all to be saved, we recognize that, that one cannot be saved if he does not know what the Bible teaches concerning salvation. I'm thankful that when we study the Bible, we learn that the Bible is that instrument used by God that can penetrate the heart of the sinner. I like to quote Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit 
and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, the Bible is a book that penetrates the heart of those in sin. I remember a young man coming to me one time, his family members were faithful to the Lord. He had been taught the truth of the gospel. He had been baptized. But like many teenagers, he was struggling. There were a lot of bad influences in his life. And he came to me almost in tears, and he said, Brother Grider, I've messed up. And he began to tell me some things in which he'd been engaged, told me about these so-called friends that had been leading him astray, and he said, I know this isn't right. I know this isn't right. He says, I don't want to live the way they're living. I'm repenting of the way I've lived. Will you pray for me? Well, you know I was happy to pray for him. And I said this to him. I said, you know, there's something you need to understand. You have engaged in some activities you say you know were wrong. And you regret what you've done. And you're repenting because you realize you need to change your mind about those things. And, and consequently change your ways and your habits. But I want to tell you something. Those others that were, were going along with you doing these things, it's likely that they do not have the remorse you have. It's likely that they are not willing to repent like you are willing to repent. And here's the reason why they do not have this word dwelling in them. You see, when you did those things, it violated your conscience. You were convicted of those things that you did because they were wrong. You knew that it was not in harmony with the Bible. And thankfully, it is the Bible which penetrated your heart, pricked your conscience, has led you back to God again. That's what the Bible is able to do. I can recall that at the age of 13, I was thinking very much about becoming a Christian. I remember that uh, uh, I knew uh, for a long time what I needed to do to become a Christian. And I was also conscious at that particular time of what sin was. And I knew I needed to have my sins washed away. I needed to be forgiven. I needed to, to be in a right relationship with God. And I didn't believe that I was in a right relationship with God. Yes, I was a young teenager, but I knew what I needed to do. And I remember on a certain day at school that I said in my, in my, in my mind and in my heart, tonight at Wednesday night Bible study, I'm going to go forward in that assembly and I'm going to be baptized. Well, that night I remember we had Bible study and then we were having a short devotion. And the invitation was extended, but I just was clinging to that pew that was in front of me. I knew in my heart what the Bible taught. I knew what I needed to do. God's Word had convicted me of my sin. I, needed, I knew I needed to, to do what was right and obey the gospel. I finally decided in my mind I couldn't do it right then because my mother wasn't feeling well that night and she wasn't there. That was my excuse. But you know, I got home that night and I was overwhelmed as I just kept thinking about the need to be baptized and the need to be right with God. And finally I... I called on my mother to come into my room, and I said, I said to her, I said, I, I need to be baptized. I don't know what I thought her reaction was, would be, but I know this. She got to feeling a whole lot better when she heard that. She said, that's wonderful news. She says, we'll go right now. I said, I've got to go right now. I said, I can't, I can't put this off any longer. And I remember my dad asked me, he says, you've been thinking about this for a while, haven't you? I said, for a long time. He said, well, we're, we're so thankful. I, my mother got on the phone and began calling all the relatives right around our home area. We had more there at the church building later on that evening. We did it Wednesday night Bible study. They were there to celebrate with me my becoming a Christian. But the point is this. The Word of God had that impact upon my heart and upon my life. And even more so today because the more you study God's Word, the more meaningful God's Word becomes. When you study God's Word, you... You are thankful for what God has done on our behalf. And likewise, you know that if you're living in sin, you can't stay that way. This, this book, God's Word, has a way of penetrating the heart of even the rankest sinner. And likewise, right along with that, it produces faith in the heart of the unbeliever. A lot of people are, are uh, looking at religion today, and there are a lot of people that are caught up uh, uh, in something that is rather mysterious or mystical. 
God's Word is plain. And Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If we want people to be converted to Christ today, then we've got to find where is the power to convert the lost to Christ. That power is where it's always been, isn't it? That power is still in the gospel of Jesus. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So I love God's Word. I love God's Word because I realize that it's, it's the product of inspiration. God gave it to us. I love God's Word because I realize that, that this book has the, the power to penetrate the heart of the sinner and uh, likewise establish faith in God, faith in God. And so uh, we extol and uphold the Bible, the Word of God. But when I think about why one should love the Word of God, I'm also reminded that the Word of God provides comfort to the Christian. Oftentimes, as I have closed out a, a memorial service of a faithful child of God, I will look at the family and I will quote from Acts chapter 20, verse 32, where Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. You know, when you study the Bible, you learn about God and you learn about man. And I think as, as I'm getting older, I, I really do enjoy studying more and more the character of God, who He is. Somebody that was on up in years, gospel preacher, said... Uh, that he realized that at his age he was getting ready for his final exams, right? And I never really had thought about it before, but all of us are getting ready for finals. We know we're going to stand before Christ in judgment. He's appointed a man once to die, and after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. I want to be ready to meet God, and I love studying about the character of God. And this passage means so much to me. I'm sure it means a lot to you 2 Corinthians 1, 3, concerning our God, He is the God of all comfort. You know, we need a lot of comfort today, don't we? We need a lot of encouragement. And uh, I say that to younger preachers particularly. Remember the people in your congregations, they're hurting. The people that are sitting in the pews, they have their struggles. And we need to help them. I've had my struggles, I've had my heartaches, so have you. And we need to know where to turn, and I, I'm so thankful we can turn to God. There are passages of Scripture that just speak to us when our hearts are hurting. They really do work. If I'm standing at the gravesite of someone that has lost a loved one, I know how I can help that individual particularly the one who has lost a family member who's gone on to be with the Lord. When you quote such passages as this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That works, doesn't it? That will comfort. Listening to Jesus say, uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That works, doesn't it? As we close, I'll give you the final point, but I can't expound on it. And it's this. I love the Word of God because of its promise of victory. You see, like the little boy who was, who was reading that scary mystery novel, but who had a smile on his face when his mother walked in. She said, how can you be smiling and laughing when you're reading such a scary novel? He said, I can smile and I can be happy because I've read the end of the book, right? You and I have read the end of the book. And if we're faithful to the Lord, God has promised we shall be victorious. And so what we're going to be doing over the course of the next few days is this. 
we're going to God's holy book divine and we're going to find enrichment, we're going to find encouragement, we're going to get to know God better. Thank you for your kind attention.
for the win. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you this morning to, if you're our visitor, to the Ripley Church of Christ, and we want you to know that you're our honored guest. And also, we are so thankful to be starting our gospel meeting this morning with Brother Grider, and we're thankful he's with us. Um, and thankful just to have a beautiful day to worship the Lord. If you will turn to number 610, that will be our first song this morning. Number 610. Jesus, my heavenly King, love me, I know. Praise to Him, I sing, not word I go. reading this morning will be taken from Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16. Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, 
just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So please bow with me this morning. Most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, creator of all things, our God, we come before you with humble hearts and singing praises to your name and giving you praise and glory this morning, Father, as you are our God. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless this congregation of your people as we strive to do your will. We pray, Father, that we'll continue to try to gain more and more knowledge of you through your holy inspired word. And we pray, Father, that you would strengthen us, comfort us when we need it, and give us all that we need, as you always do. Father, we're so thankful for this gospel meeting this week. We're thankful for Brother Grider and his wife for being with us today. And we pray that you will be with us and be with the meeting and it will be successful. And we pray, Father, that we'll take the things that we hear this week and that we will... Search them out in the scriptures, for we know they'll be true, and we pray, Father, that we'll be better for being here and for hearing more from your word. Father, we are mindful of those that are on our prayer list, those that are listed as sick, those especially that are battling disease of cancer. We pray that you'd be with all of them. We pray that you'd be with those that are treating them, Father. We pray that you would strengthen them that they would be getting the treatment that they need, and if it be thy will, that they be restored and made whole. We're thankful for those that have recently had surgeries and that are uh, recovering and have uh, been are back with us. We're thankful for the success of those surgeries, and we pray, Father, that you continue to bless them in their recuperation. Father, we're weak and sinful creatures. We sin daily, and we ask, Father, for your forgiveness of those sins. We pray that you will be merciful to us. We pray, Father, that we'll go to your word and we'll look to you for strength when we're tempted, and that we're um, weak, and that you will give us that strength. Father, most of all, we're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, for his willingness to come to earth, to become as we are, yet to live a perfect life, leave us a perfect example, and then willingly go to the cross and shed his innocent blood on our behalf so that we might have redemption and the cleansing of our sins through his blood in your eyes. Father, we pray that we'll strive to live more like Jesus every day. And we're so thankful for our Savior, and we're thankful for your love. And we pray, Father, that you will always love us. We ask all this in the holy name of Jesus, and amen. In order to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, let's turn to number 337. Number 337. And we'll sing all five verses. Man
Let us bow and offer thanks for the bread. Our Father, we thank thee for this bread which represents Christ's broken body as he hanged on the cross. May we partake of it now in a way well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Father, we thank Thee for this cup, which represents Christ's shed blood as He hanged on the cross. May we partake of it now in a way well-pleasing in Thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Father, we're thankful for all the material things of life we enjoy every day. May we return a portion to help further thy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you all please stand before our song, before our lesson. Our song for our lesson will be number 548. Number 548. We'll sing all three verses. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's a fair substance. so glad that we have another great crowd today, another great crowd of people assembled for God's glory. As we studied last week, we can say that we are all here gathered together in the presence of the Lord to hear the thing.
intended by God. And we're looking forward to the beginning of our gospel meeting with Brother Barry Grider. He and his wife, Celicia, are here with us this week. They have three children who are all in college. They now serve with the Riverbend Church of Christ in Dalton, Georgia. Uh, Brother Barry has preached in uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Texas, and Georgia now. And we are very thankful for him, his work, all the great works that he has done in the past and all that he continues to do. He had a great message for us this morning in Bible class, and we are looking forward to another great sermon this morning, tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. And so I know that you'll be excited to be here for each and every one of those services and the meals preceding them. We're so thankful to have Brother Dreider with us, and we'll turn it over to him now. During the Bible class hour, Brother Donnie mentioned that, uh, uh, that at one time he served at the Riverbend Church in Dalton, Georgia. Indeed, he did. And I know the brethren at uh, Riverbend very much loved uh, Brother and Sister DeBoard. I'm thankful that uh, he is doing what he's doing now, not only ministering to this congregation, but the work that he's doing at Freed Hardeman. I'm thankful that we have men who love God and who love God's Word who are imparting that precious truth to our young people. That's some wonderful young people right in front of me today. And we want to do all that we can to lift up the gospel of Christ and let them know that there is, is hope and that there is uh, much to be happy about because God reigneth in heaven. And so we can make it through this life and make it through this life successfully if we'll turn to the Word of God and seek out His principles. Now, during the Bible class hour, uh, we really talked about God communicating to us. He does that primarily through His Word. God speaks to us through His Word. And therefore, if we want to grow in our relationship with God, we recognize that we have to be diligent Bible students. But what about our communication with God? He communicates to us through His Word. How do we communicate with Him? Well, we communicate with Him through prayer. What a privilege it is to pray. I often struggle when I'm in a gospel meeting wondering what's the best message to preach to a Sunday morning audience in a gospel meeting. It varies what I preach on the Sunday morning of a gospel meeting, but I have selected this morning this study on prayer because I trust that through this study it will help you in your relationship with God. A relationship is built on good communication. God communicates to us through His Word, we communicate with Him through prayer. But you know, prayer can be a struggle, can't it? All of us probably would admit that we'd like to have a stronger prayer life. Prayer can be something complex to us. We're not sure about it. We know we're supposed to pray, but maybe deep within our minds we ask, questions that we don't really want anybody else to hear us, like, are we really getting through to God? Is He really interested? There was a doctoral student who asked the famed Albert Einstein, Dr. Einstein, what else is left out there of original dissertation research? Einstein's answer might surprise you. He turned to the young man and he said, Find out more about prayer. He said, we've got to learn more about prayer. Now, prayer seems so simple, doesn't it? And yet, if you're like me, I sometimes have struggled with my prayers. I sometimes have to make myself pray. It is a discipline. But I must pray because I know this, God has commanded that we pray. And Samuel went as far as to say, if, 
If he ceased praying for the people, he would sin against God. And so we know we're supposed to pray. And no one encouraged us to pray more than the Lord Jesus Christ because we say we want to be like Him, then we better pray. And if the Lord Jesus Christ found it essential to pray, then surely I must find it necessary to engage in, in regular prayer. But sometimes praying can be difficult. One of my favorite preachers was named James Watkins. And Brother Watkins used to say if you're struggling with your prayer life, he said, talk to God about it. Think about that just a moment. If you're struggling with your prayers, then talk to God about it. And after a while, you'll find out that you are able to do what you thought perhaps you couldn't do. Because what is prayer? Talking to God about it. Uh, Paul would put it like this. Let your, or Peter rather, 1 Peter 5, 7, let your requests be made known unto God. Why? Because God cares for you. It was Paul who reminded us to rejoice in Philippians 4, 4, and then he begins to talk about prayer. He says, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In 1 Peter 5, 7, I believe I... Mentioned a moment ago, casting all your care upon, upon, uh, upon God because He cares for you. So we have Jesus that spoke about prayer. We have Peter and Paul talking about prayer. And therefore, we certainly learn the need or the importance to pray. Now, when I think about our Lord Jesus Christ and His prayer life, think about this. Mark 1.35 states that Jesus would arise early in the morning... Find him a solitary place, and there he would pray. Now, I have no doubt that that is how Jesus began every day. Wouldn't you expect that Jesus would begin each day praying? That every day he got up, well, it was real early, so he wouldn't be disturbed. And he found him a quiet place where he could be alone with God, and there he would pray. I think one reason that Jesus got up early to pray, He didn't want to be disturbed by His disciples. Jesus was busy. The disciples knew there was always an agenda that they were going to have to follow because Jesus was going to keep them busy every day. And so before the disciples would come to Him and ask, Lord, what are we going to do today? Jesus realized it was important that He engage in time of prayer. And oh, how intimate were the prayers that Jesus prayed as revealed in John 17. So we have Jesus regularly praying, praying to the Father, and never in all of these prayers did He ever question whether God existed or not. He knew He was there. And he spoke about that relationship that He had with God the Father before the foundations of the earth were laid. Again, that's from His prayer that's recorded in John 17. And so Jesus prayed. And we often talk about Jesus being such a marvelous example, and that He was. And surely we want to be more and more like Him. Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about how important it is to know Jesus. In fact, I believe that was, was a priority in Paul's life more than anything else. He wanted to know Christ. We might ask the question today, why come to Jesus why seek the forgiveness of your sins? Somebody might say, well, I, I want to be forgiven of my sins because I don't want to be in that place called hell. Neither do I. But is that the only motivating factor in becoming a Christian? Perhaps someone else says, well, I want to be a Christian because I want to go to heaven. And so do I. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. But maybe this is the chief motivating factor as to why one should become a Christian. And that is that in becoming a Christian, you establish a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I want to know Him. I want my life to conform to His. I want to know more about the power of His resurrection. And when we make knowing Christ the number one goal of our lives, that will take care of heaven and hell. No greater motivation than being forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus and likewise getting to know Him 
no greater motivation to pray. Well, when we pray, we realize we have the privilege of talking to God. And as it's sometimes expressed, we come to God through Christ. And so the devotional reading just a moment ago is so important and so impressive. Seeing then that we have that, this great high priest, that imagery would certainly be understood by those to whom Hebrews was written. Seeing then that we have this great high priest who's passed into the heavens, you know where he is, seated at the right hand of God. Let us hold fast this profession of faith we have made. Why? Because we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Now think about that statement for just a moment. Jesus the Christ, because of who He is, and because of what He did, was able to take the holy hand of God and the sinful hand of man, and He reconciled the two. You see, the text says that He was God in the flesh. He knew God. And he came from God. And likewise, it says he was tempted in all points like as we are. Tempted in all points like as we are, he relates to us. Yet without sin, he relates to a holy God. No one better to reconcile us unto the God of heaven than Jesus the Christ. Now, realizing who he is and what he does on our behalf leads us to that last verse there, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we read that word boldly and we perhaps think, well, does that mean a child of God should come arrogantly or boastfully before the throne of God? No, but we do have the right to come before God through prayer because of who Jesus is and because what Jesus has accomplished for us. So how thankful we should be that through Him we can go to the Father in prayer. Now Jesus recognized the importance of prayer when He stated to His disciples that all men ought always to pray and not to faint. You know, these disciples of Jesus had evidently seen Him pray many times. And they asked Him to teach them how to pray. Luke 11, 1. Lord, teach us how to pray, as John has taught his disciples how to pray. Well, John was a great man, but when it comes to studying prayer, I really want to hear Jesus, don't you? Jesus did not mock his disciples on that occasion. He taught them, didn't he? Teach us, Lord, how to pray. As one who has been involved in preaching just about all of my adult life, I find it interesting that no disciple asked Jesus how to preach. Lord, teach us how to preach. Nobody could preach better than Jesus, right? When you study Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, you read all those marvelous principles that are found there in the Sermon on the Mount. The text says the people were astonished at His doctrine, for He taught them as one having authority. And so Jesus knew how to preach. He was the master evangelist. But His disciples asked Him, Lord, help us to pray. Teach us how to pray. And it's interesting that when Jesus taught His disciples how to pray, He taught them in such a concise way. For your prayer and my prayer to be effective, it doesn't have to be a lengthy prayer, does it? The model prayer just has some 69 words, I believe, in it. Now, there may be occasions in your life where you have prayed all through the night because your heart was, was so heavy and filled with sorrow. But a prayer doesn't have to be very lengthy in order to be effective. For Jesus Himself said that our Heavenly Father already knows what we need before we pray. Well, why then pray if He already knows what we need? We realize that when we pray, we don't have to inform God of anything. He already knows everything. And yet there is something about that prayer of a child of God offered to the Heavenly Father that is pleasing to the Father in Heaven. It expresses a dependence upon God. If we're independent of God, we're in rebellion toward Him, aren't we? But when we're dependent of God, we please Him. 
And so that prayer that we offer to God, recognizing who He is, recognizing how much we need Him, and saying to Him, Lord, You know the answers. Grant me the request of my heart. We know He will hear our prayers. Now let me say this about prayer. We know that our God in heaven is not some magical genie. He's a heavenly Father. Don't forget that. He's not there just to answer us on a whim. Every wish we make, He's going to fulfill those wishes? No. Because not every wish that I have is good for me. I hope that I can, can help all of us understand this today. That our God in heaven really does have our best interest at heart. Okay. I want us to believe that because the Scriptures make that abundantly clear. James 1.17 reminds us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow that is cast by turning. You and I can depend on God, and He wants us to depend on Him. My children, your children, can depend on us because we love them. I know we read stories every once in a while about children who were abused, and that breaks our hearts, doesn't it? That's not normal. That's not natural. We love our children, and we want what's best for our children. There have been times when my children have asked me for something, and I've had to say no. They may not like that answer at the time, But I can assure you that I have never said to my children, no, because I enjoyed persecuting them. I've never said no to them because I like denying them things. No, that's not why I said that to them. I said no because I had something better in mind. Or perhaps I said no because I knew that if I said yes, it might be harmful to my children. We can understand how that works between parents and children. Sometimes God may say a resounding yes to our prayers. Sometimes He perhaps says, wait a while, wait a while. And sometimes He says, no. I think I've lived long enough to understand that when God says no, that's in my best interest. There have been moments as I look back along the course of my life where I know that God answered some prayers with a resounding yes, and I still thank Him. There have also been times when He said no, and I've learned to thank Him for saying no. I prayed diligently when I was a young person about the age of those that are right here before me. I prayed diligently that I would one day find a good woman to marry. Well, the Lord answered that prayer by providing a great woman for me to marry, not just a good woman. He always always blesses and blesses above and beyond what we can imagine sometimes. But you know, all through my 20s, I was praying, Lord, please provide for me a good wife. There were times I thought maybe God wasn't listening There were times when I thought I knew the answer, but didn't turn out to be the right answer. But eventually the time came where He provided me with what I desired. Because one thing I know for sure, God wants us to pray when we're young for a mate. Because God wants us to have a happy home life, doesn't He? He he wants to see husbands and wives who are in love with with one another, and who are committed to Him. God desires that. So that's a good prayer to pray when you're young and you're seeking out a husband or a wife. God has our best interest at heart. And so sometimes He says, yes, what you want, that's my desire also. Sometimes He says, no, that's not good for you. Sometimes He says, I want you to wait just a little while because you're not ready for this just yet. Or he may say, I have something better in mind for you. Now I've got to take that approach, and so must you, 
when we go to God in prayer. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says that prayer is something we do continually. Pray without ceasing, the text says. Now, that doesn't mean that we're to be praying all of the time, because if we're praying all the time, then, then we're not going to have time to study our Bibles. And if we're praying all the time, we're not going to have any time to, to go to our jobs during the day or study at school. If we're praying all the time, we'll not have any, any uh, time for evangelism. What he means in that passage is this. Pray with regularity. Pray regularly. Make sure that you have built into your daily schedule times in which you can bow your head in prayer. It may not be a lengthy prayer, remember, but you're praying nonetheless. You're praying to a God who wants to hear from you, who loves that communion. He's spoken to us through His Word, and in His Word He's revealed, I want you to pray. So let's pray, please Him by learning to discipline ourselves so that we can, so that we can pray. Now when we think about God being a Father... I am reminded of the fact that there are so many passages in Scripture that speak of God high and lifted up and exalted, like Isaiah 6, 1 and following. Or He's presented as He so often is in the Psalms as one who is reigning in the heavens, one who is seated in majesty. And we might begin to feel like, well, how could that great God of heaven who created the entire universe be mindful of me. Who am I? It is the very fact that God is so great and so mighty and so powerful that He can hear every one of us pray at the same time. Can I understand that? No, I can't understand that. I'm a mere man. I can't understand a great God like that but I know that He can hear our prayers. Every one of us, when we pray, He can hear our prayers. And it is as if we are the only ones that are coming before Him in prayer at that particular moment. But we sometimes wonder, how, how could this great God really care about me? How could He really care about you? But He does. And the Bible reveals just how He wants to be identified. And that is, He wants to be identified as our Father. There is nothing wrong. It is completely scriptural to bow your head and say, Dear God up in heaven, but I much prefer this, my Father who is in heaven. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul says, we are all the children of God by faith that is in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you ever heard someone, maybe a celebrity, who um, may say something like this, We know we are all God's children, right? Well, I recognize the fact that, that we are all God's children by creation. That is, each person that is alive was made in the very image of God. But you know, in a more specific way, the Bible says we're God's children by redemption, right? Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? In Christ. And I believe chief among those spiritual blessings must be this privilege we have to pray. And so Jesus says, after this manner, I want you to pray, our Father who is in heaven. Psalmist put it like this. He says, like as a father pitieth his children, so God pitieth them, or is tender toward them that fear him. Psalm 103, 13. But what do we say when we pray? I believe that passage over in Philippians 4 that I mentioned earlier really tells us what we're to say when we pray. It seems to me that when we pray, we could, we could look at prayer from four different vantage points. And they are found here in this particular passage. Now Paul is speaking about rejoicing in Philippians. I love to study Philippians. 
I love to study Philippians perhaps more than any other book because I love the, the joy that Paul has in his heart even though he's cut off from family and friends. He's writing from prison and yet he maintains that relationship with the Lord. It never wavers. And even in prison, he said he could rejoice. Rejoice in whom? Rejoice in the Lord. Now think about that just for a moment because people might say something like this. Well, how can you be happy all the time? You know, Paul would also say rejoice in the Lord always. There's a difference between joy and happiness. There really is. Happiness deals with external circumstances. And external circumstances aren't always good, are they? But joy is something deep within Jesus said, I, I want you to know my joy. He said, the joy that I have, I want that to be in you. It's something that, that's found deep within and comes from a right relationship with God. So Paul says, don't rejoice in your circumstances. Circumstances may be good. They weren't for him at the time. But he says, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes on to say there in that passage, do not be anxious about anything. Well, that hits home for most of us, doesn't it? Don't be overly anxious about anything because God is still on the throne. He's still your God. He's still interested in you. He still wants to, to answer your prayers, and He will. He's going to get you through. And so He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, with supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now one thing... All of us should desire to do when we pray is this. Take a moment just to praise God for who He is. Did you know our troubles will begin to dissipate when we start praising God more for who He is? Praise Him for His creation, yes, but also praise Him for His character. Give Him praise and honor. We do that in song, don't we? So many of the hymns that we sing give praise to God and extol His holy name. Let's do that in prayer. It's amazing to me when I study the Psalms how that David, for example, might begin talking to God as he pours out his, his heart. He talks about his troubles. Everybody is bent on destroying him. But before the Psalm is over, David, David is bursting forth with praise for God. It's amazing what that will do for you as you pray just to spend some time praising God for who He is. And not only that, giving thanks unto Him. Count your blessings Name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord has done. Prayer is a time for confession. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Faithful and just, that's right. Faithful means He always will. Just means He's justified in doing it through Christ. So don't be afraid to take your sins before the throne of God and seek His forgiveness. He's ready to forgive. Jesus died that you might be forgiven. Then the text says, let your requests be made known unto God. What is a good definition of prayer? I think more than anything else, it's asking God. It's making requests. Prayer is asking. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And it's continual. You could read the passage like this. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Don't give up. Keep on praying because prayer works. And so there is a pattern we find in the Bible with regard to how we are to pray. In James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. He says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, listen, it avails much. He uses the Old Testament prophet Elijah as an example. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, it avails much. I do indeed believe in prayer. I believe in prayer because God is perfect and right in all that He says and, and does. And He says, I want you to pray. That's how you commune with me, through prayer. I want you to pray because... I want to hear what's on your heart and in your mind. I want to know you depend upon me. I want you to, to pray. And when we pray, we must pray believing. We must pray in faith. Prayer is the key to heaven, somebody said, but, but faith unlocks the door. I want you to notice with me 1 John chapter 5. Listen to what John writes 
with regard to the subject of prayer. He says in verse... Um, he says in verse 14, This is the confidence that we have in Him, in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Well, that is a verse that tells us that God answers prayer. If we trust Him. Now, God has proven Himself over and over again. We know we can trust Him. Even though we may not always understand the nature of prayer, even though we may not always understand the complexities surrounding prayer and how God answers, we must trust Him. I am trusting God with my soul, aren't you? I'm going to go out into eternity one day and when I do, I'm trusting my soul will be saved through the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross on my behalf. If I can trust this God with my soul that's made to live somewhere forever, surely then I'm going to spend time in prayer and trusting Him to answer my prayers. I have lived long enough. I'm almost 60, just turned 58. I've lived long enough to understand there's great power in prayer. And there is peace in my heart because I've learned to pray. And yet I still study this subject because I want my prayer life to be better. In fact, on Tuesday mornings at the Riverbend Church, a group of retired folks gather with me each Tuesday, and right now we're just studying the Bible doctrine of prayer in detail so that hopefully we can increase our communion with God and have more confidence in prayer, learn more how to pray. There have been times in my life when I was not sure if God answered this prayer or not. Or maybe I wasn't sure how He was going to answer it or if He, if he ever would answer it. But I can say this to you. I've had enough of my prayers answered that I'm going to keep on praying, haven't you? I'm going to keep on praying. And I'm going to keep on praying till I draw my last breath or Jesus comes first. There are some regrets you and I will have when this life is over. Perhaps there will be many. But I know this. We will never, ever regret the time we spend studying the Bible, drawing closer to God as He speaks to us. And we will never regret the time that we spend in private, personal prayer. And think about this, we oftentimes pray in a public assembly. We know that's good and that's right. But the way one leads a prayer in a public assembly, obviously, is not the way one prays in private. For when one leads prayer in a public assembly, he's praying on behalf of everybody. But when one enters into the closet of prayer, it's just the individual and God. And he that keeps you and me does not sleep nor slumber. He's always available. And he's always ready to listen. And he's always ready to answer. I don't know how you begin your day, but Jesus began his day by praying, didn't he? And I can't think of a, a better way to end the day than to be praying. I've had some people say to me before, said, Brother Grider, I feel a little bad at times because I'm so tired at night. I start praying. Before I know it, I've gone to sleep without saying amen. <laughs> and I sometimes say to the person this, what better way to go to sleep than talking to God, right? That must be very, very pleasing to the Heavenly Father that as we're falling asleep, we're talking to Him your prayer life.
Maybe someone in the audience this morning looks honestly on the inside and can say, I know I don't really have a prayer life. And you know the reason you don't have a prayer life is because you're not in Christ. And this is a spiritual blessing that belongs to those in Christ. But you can enjoy this spiritual blessing if you'll come to Christ. If as a penitent believer you will confess His sweet name and be baptized into Him, all the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy will belong also to you, including the privilege of prayer. I may be speaking to a child of God this morning who says, I believe prayer is important, but I've not had an active prayer life. Maybe you've been burdened with some particular sin, and that's prevented you from praying. Don't let your sin prevent you from praying, but as a child of God, take that sin before the throne of God and seek His forgiveness. He's ready. Be restored to a right relationship with God. The only way you can have that is through prayer. So don't neglect prayer. Prayer is what restores that relationship to God for the Christian. Maybe someone is here this morning who's, who's struggling with his prayer life because you feel so overwhelmed and burdened. Don't give up praying to God who will see you through. He will. And there's something else that we need to remember, and that is sometimes it's good for us just to seek the prayers of our brethren, right? The way we sometimes do that is just ask, members of the church just to step out where you are and come down to the front of the assembly and just let us know what's on your heart, what's on your mind, what your struggle may be. And if you say, you know, I really could use some prayer, you know what we'll do? We'll bow our heads and we'll pray on your behalf. Because what are we interested in more than anything else? We're interested in helping each other go to heaven We're interested in drawing one another closer to Jesus. That's what we're doing. And I'm so thankful that God has given us such a simple way of drawing close to Him. Through Bible study, He's speaking to us. And through prayer, we speak to Him. This morning, as we sing the invitation hymn, you do some personal inventory. And I pray that as you do that, you will examine your life as I will mine. Perhaps you will say, I need to recommit myself to having a more faithful prayer life. Or perhaps there's another area in your life that that needs some correcting, where you need to turn around and go in the other direction. And I pray that you'll make those changes this morning. And if you need to respond to the invitation in a public way, We stand ready to help you, and we will be praying that you will respond, because I guarantee you, there's somebody here this morning, somebody, who needs to respond to heaven's invitation. And somebody has been praying that you'll respond fervently. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see that prayer answered this very morning because of a decision that you made that you're going to come to Christ right now as we stand and sing.
We have just a few announcements to make this morning before we conclude our service. Uh, we want to thank Brother Grider for that excellent lesson this morning. We thank you all for being here today, and we invite you back to uh, worship with us again tonight at 7 and each night through Wednesday this week to hear Brother Grider. Uh, we'll have a fellowship meal immediately following our service this morning in the fellowship hall. Please stay with us if you can. Uh, we invite all our visitors to, uh, to stay uh, and, and eat with us. Uh, also this afternoon at 4, we have our uh, trunk or treat. Uh, there'll be decorated trunks, treats, games, snacks, and some more. So all ages are invited. Please remember the family of Jim Pannell in your prayers who uh, passed away recently. His visitation will be today at McBride's funeral home from 1 to 3, uh, the memorial service at 3 today. And also remember the family of uh, Benny Goolsby, uh, Burns, Tennessee, formerly of Ripley. He passed away Thursday, and his funeral will be at McBride's tomorrow at 11, uh, visitations from 10 to 11 in the morning. Our young men led our area-wide youth rally last Sunday night. They did a great job. We thank them for the good job they did. Cooper uh, brought the lesson, Sam, uh, and Nathan, and Hunter, and Hayden all participated in that service. We thank them for all their hard work. We thank Cody for working with them, and Tucker and Cole for working with them on Saturdays. Uh, we're proud of all our young people and uh, for the good work that they do um, in all the areas. There's a sign-up sheet for a ladies' night out uh, security class at Southern Magnolia Home in Corinth. I guess the ladies know what that is. I, um, it'll be sometime in November. If you're interested in that, there's a sign-up list in the foyer, or also you can see Lori Lynn Thompson for details about that. Also, Kate Harrison uh, has another opportunity to serve on a medical mission trip uh, in, with uh, Fried Hardeman, her group, in uh, January. If you want to help with that, please uh, contribute uh, that, help, help with that, see one of the elders, and also please pray for them as they prepare for this trip. We want to wish happy birthday today to Sandra Graves. We hope she has a good one. Um, hope she has a great day. Any other announcements we need to make at this time? Again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for our visitors uh, for being here. We we'll invite you back every time that you have a chance to worship with us. Uh, and during the gospel meeting is a great chance to, to visit some more. So we hope you all will be here. Cody, you got... Encourage you all to join us at 4 today for the trunk or treat like he... Uh, he referenced. Uh, also want to announce next Saturday we will have our youth group Halloween party. Uh, they'll do someday Saturday like they do every week and then somewhere around 6.30 we'll uh, head to Halloween Harvest here in Ripley. It's a haunted trail. We'll go participate in that. We'll do some pumpkin carving and that kind of thing. Uh, the next day, which is uh, next Sunday night, we will have our congregation-wide basketball game. we got a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, we actually Please sign up, come play, come participate, or come laugh at us and enjoy watching it. It'll be a good time to fellowship. It's always uh, fun when we do that kind of thing. Uh, and also there is a sign-up sheet in the back for EYC. Uh, we need to get signed up for that as quickly as we can. Uh, we need some chaperones to volunteer for that. And uh, kids, we need to, to make sure we get signed up quickly so we can make sure to get a, a good spot in it. And my wife also asked me to announce it's also Carly's birthday today. She turned three uh, this morning and she is super wore out from, she just waved at me. She tried to put up three. There we go. Um, but she's, she's very excited about that. So thank y'all. Y'all please stand for our closing song and closing prayer. So the closing song will be number 875 and we'll sing the first and last verse. If for the price you have striven, as your labors are poor, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Of the souls, blessed be, come apart, free from all care.
hospital nurse 